There he is. Roberto. You conjured him. Oh. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Judy Raforzo. Here. All right. Uh, now. Uh, John's now. here. Sorry. Hi, John. Yeah, we saw you pop up your name. <laughs> All right. Um, announcements from commissioners. I think Donna wants to start off. Yes, the Halifax House uh, Thursday from 5 to 7 has their 75th anniversary. They'd like everyone to come 5 to 7, food, wine, live music. And, uh, so I plan to be there. So if everyone can stop by, uh, Carrie, I think would appreciate it. Great. Anyone else? Any other commissioner? Adon Linda? Uh, Friends of Mission Trail will be working on Saturday morning, starting at 9.30, uh, across from the Red, the um, Redwood Grove. Um, we did a big clearing and planting of um, some, some smaller trees after they cleared everything out of eucalyptus, and now we're going to be weeding that whole meadow. So if any of you are walking by, you don't have to pull weeds, but just say hi. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Ellen? Uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, thank the staff for uh, putting together uh, the Mother's Day giveaway. I think that Donna and, and um, <clears throat> John would agree that we had the easy part <laughs> and the joyful part of giving the bouquets to the mothers, and it was really great fun. And um, people, uh, mothers really appreciated it. Grandmothers really appreciate it. And they walked away with a really big smile on their face. So thank you. You made me feel jealous that I did not participate. Well, we also, uh, I want to add, we also gave away the city's leftover centennial uh, wine openers and the wine caddies with uh, people were very surprised, especially some men already would uh, to get those and they were well received to give those away. So anytime we have any kind of giveaway, uh, people enjoy because the word free or complimentary is sort of shakes them up a little. So, <laughs> and some of the children, we gave the flower to hand to their mother. So it was, it's, it's always nice to give out flowers. Thank you, Ashley and staff, Leslie. They're accommodating anything we need, they take care of. And we have the best, I love that, but that where we're located, always in front of the shell is the prime location. Thanks for that. Great. <clears throat> All right, announcements from staff. Announcements from staff. So um, <clears throat> I don't have a lot today. Um, the board and commission appointments will be happening likely at the May 17th um, budget meeting um, as a special item. There were a handful of people who were traveling and needed to be interviewed. I just want you to have awareness of it. No one on this commission has termed out. We won't have any people term out until 2023. So, but that is happening. We're status quo for the time being. Um, the budget process continues apace. Um, there will be a special meeting May 17th to go through all of the budget questions that the city has received. Um, at this last council meeting last week, the council received its first view of um, proposed operating budget. So that's the numbers that we talked about um, for community activities, um, for supporting the farmer's market. So far, we haven't had any questions about the community activities budget. Um, some library questions, but not community activities questions at this point in time. Um, <clears throat> so if you are interested in where we're headed with the budget or you do have questions yourselves, get those submitted to us um, and then stay tuned for May 17th. And then we'll be looking at um, an, at least one to two more budget meetings in early June. And that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, public appearances for anything that isn't appearing on today's agenda. I don't see anyone. Okay. Uh, approval of the minutes from the April 12th regular meeting. I make a motion we approve the minutes. I'll second. Uh, 
Linda Calafiori. Yes. Donna Jett. Yes. Ellen Martin. Yes. John Mysick. Yes. Judy Refrezo. Yes. <laughs> Approved. Thank you. All right. Item number two, receive a presentation from Environmental Compliance Manager, Anya's Mar Martleta, regarding ways to make city events more sustainable. Yay. So this is one of our strategic plans goals. Um, for those of you who don't know her, this is Anya Smartlet, and she is here. She's our Environmental Compliance Manager. Um, she's amazing at her job and does all different kinds of things for the city. <clears throat> making sure that we are all composting and recycling and um, being as green as we possibly can. So I'm going to turn it over to Anya's for ways that we can look at improving our events and the things that we're already doing citywide to make sure that we are um, supporting our environment. Take it away, Anya's. All right. Good morning, commissioners. So I have a short presentation for you guys. Um, I'll share my screen. And yeah, you guys can all see this, right? Okay, so how do we reduce the environmental impacts of our public events? I uh, hear some uh, lovely pictures of some good, some bad, right? Uh, lower right hand corner is good. Uh, upper right hand corner, not so good. We do have some garbage issues every once in a while. Lower left hand corner is actually fairly recent. Uh, and those are some of our stormwater issues that we have on occasion when something spills in the gutter. So, so where do we start? There are quite a few different things we can look at when we're looking at the environment and how we can reduce our impact. So I'll go over some of the big ticket items uh, that I work on. Uh, stormwater issues uh, is the first one. And then waste reduction is another big ticket item. And more recently, we started working on climate action also. And so I wanted to touch on that a little bit. So I always start like to start with my horse. Uh, <laughs> so this is Smokey, um, and I've learned a lot from him. And one thing that I've learned that uh, really applies to horses, but I think applies to people as well, is it's really good. It's really good to make it easy to do the right thing first, and then make it hard to do the wrong thing. Uh, we tend to jump to making it hard to do the wrong thing right away, uh, fines and telling people they're doing the wrong thing. But really, if we can help people do the right thing first, um, I think we have an easier time overall. So anyway, that's one of my big um, life lessons. And so starting with stormwater, um, we are, uh, so the stormwater in Carmel flows directly to the bay or to our Mission Trail Nature Preserve without any treatment. And uh, what you end up finding in stormwater, which is basically runoff uh, when it rains, is everything that accumulates on our street ends up in it. So you'll find sediment, bacteria, trash, heavy metals, oil and grease, nutrients all kinds of things which turn it into it can be a toxic soup and and therefore it's heavily regulated by the state so you know we do have a permit uh, from the state uh, water resource control board and we have many requirements we have to meet in order to be in compliance with that permit and this is one of the big uh, programs that i implement in the city so just to give you a little bit of uh, background on our storm drainage system. So this is a map of the city of Carmel. You have the, you know, Carmel Bay is down on the bottom end of the screen there. Mission Trail Nature Preserve is upper right hand corner. These red dots actually mark where we have hydrodynamic separators, which are big vaults that collect trash and sediment from our storm drainage system. Uh, so they do help reduce our impact uh, on uh, our coastal resources, but they only do, you know, a, a small amount of work compared to how much water actually comes down our streets. We have a couple of really big, uh, well, three 
big drainage systems. The Fourth Avenue watershed collects, then that comes out of the Fourth Avenue outfall. I'm sure you've all seen it if you've walked on the beach. Um, that collects all of our, the north side of the city. That's a fairly large watershed, a lot of water. And then we have our Ocean out Avenue outfall, which collects water from most of downtown. So potentially um, has the most potential for contamination. And then Mission Trail is the other one that collects quite a bit of water from the east side of town. Uh, so that gives you sort of an overview of what our drainage system looks like in Carmel. So our big role in stormwater is nothing but rain down the storm drain. That's that's sort of our motto by which uh, you know we we design the whole program. Is we really as much as possible don't want to see anything else but rain in the storm drain. It was designed really just to deal with rainwater. It was never designed to treat it. So what do we see that goes into the storm drain uh, that uh, we consider illegal discharges? One, so the two bold ones here are the ones that we see most commonly in Carmel, uh, hosing and pressure washing runoff. That is considered, that is illegal. Um, hosing and, and wash water from pressure washing needs to go into either a landscape area or it needs to be directed to the sanitary sewer. Um, and the other one that we see fairly, fairly often, a little less these days, but we just had one last week, is sanitary sewer overflows, right around the corner from uh, the library, actually. And thank you to Ashley for calling me to, <laughs> to respond. Um, and actually, everybody, really, I, I have to say this, there's only one of me, and having others uh, be aware of what is, what is a, an illicit discharge really helps us find them and, um, and stop those discharges and make sure it doesn't happen again and make sure we keep our storm drains as clean as possible. Um, and other, you know, illicit discharge that, discharges you might see, uh, paint and paint cleaning runoff. If you see any paint near a storm drain, um, that's a real issue. Uh, leaky dumpsters, that happens on occasion if uh, there's um, uh, related to garbage. Uh, and then some construction related um, runoff such as uh, sediment, you know, sediment in runoff uh, during the rain. We really, construction sites have to do a lot of, uh, have to, you know, put in a lot of BMPs, best management practices to reduce the amount of sediment that leaves the site. So uh, if you see a construction site that has a lot of sediment leaving the site, that's another uh, illicit discharge. <clears throat> and finally, another one we see on occasion, we haven't seen it in a while, is water leaks. That's really not, technically not an illicit discharge but we do keep an eye on it because they should minimize the amount of sediment that goes out to, when that happens. So who do we call when uh, we see an illegal discharge? Um, really, if it's a hazardous, if you're pretty sure it's a sewer release or there's gasoline involved, call fire department and uh, either me or if I don't answer, uh, Rob in Public Works. Uh, we will all respond and we will respond uh, quickly uh, because we need to stop those as quickly as we can. Anything that's non-hazardous where you're not really sure what it is or looks like a water leak or there's somebody power washing and just call uh, Rob or myself or even the public works main line, just it'll, it'll get to me. And uh, same thing if you don't know, if you're not sure what it is. And then construction side discharges, uh, building the building department would be who you would call. And it's really helpful if you take a photo. Um, if it's an active discharge and we're gonna respond right away, like our hazardous release, it's it's not maybe not as critical uh, because we're gonna be right there. But if it's something that's not as uh, where you're not sure, or it's not as it's not a hazardous release, we might not get to it right away. So it's really good to have photo documentation. So a couple of notes on uh, best practices uh, related that may or may not um, be related to public events. There is any uh, outdoor power washing, any outdoor cleaning. Uh, we want to make sure uh, any power washing the water gets either goes into the landscape or um, is uh, 
uh, collected and um, directed into the sanitary store. It doesn't go into the storm drain. Also, no soaps outdoors. Same thing with vendors, they need to do the same thing. And then any water from coolers or uh, ice need to be put into planters or landscaping, not, not put out in the, in the street or the gutter. And another one that may uh, affect public activities, any painting or paint, paint clearing, uh, cleaning outdoors, we want to make sure um, as much as possible, latex paint is better than oil-based paint just because latex paint is uh, non-hazardous, whereas oil-based paint is a hazardous material. So, you know, the disposal of it is a bigger issue when it's oil-based paint. So I always recommend, if possible, to use latex. Uh, dried up latex can be put in the trash, um, whereas uh, the old oil paint is just a lot harder to deal with. It has to go through the household hazardous waste facility. And then obviously cleaning up spills uh, right away and don't do any rinsing or anything in the street or storm drain. Okay, so moving on from stormwater, something maybe slightly more fun, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> waste reduction and recycling. So California has a waste reduction goal of 70, 75%. We're not quite there yet. Uh, City of Carmel diversion rate is pretty good. We're at about 60%, we're near 60%. If you look at this graph, the light blue line is the City of Carmel. And these are all the local uh, peninsula cities. So the only one that's doing a little better than we are is the Pebble Beach Community Services District. So we're, 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 we're doing well, but you know we still have a ways to go to get to 75% um, diversion. Now, uh, some of our goals uh, for the program, uh, we, that program is also highly regulated by the state. Uh, we have several uh, rules and regulations on recycling and now composting. Uh, and I won't bore you with the details, but uh, we do have some pretty, uh, pretty strict goals and we get audited every year by CalRecycle. So it's, um, it's another heavy pull. And our big goals are to minimize waste at the source as much as possible. We want to expand our food waste collection program. Um, we want to expand recycling at our city facilities and public spaces. And another biggie, which is, which is a little bit harder sometimes to, to get to, is we want to reduce contamination of recyclables because it really doesn't serve us very well to do all this recycling if if it is contaminated because it ends up in the landfill either way. So waste reduction. Uh, so this graph shows you uh, what, uh, what our waste streams are made of uh, right now. So in gray, we have our sol the solid waste. This is the, pie, the piece of the pie we want to reduce. And right now it's at about you know, almost 44%. Yard trimmings is a pretty large piece of the pie, and that's a really easy piece of the pie to deal with. Um, that gets composted at the waste management district in Marina. Then we have the recyclables, which is about 26% of the pie, which is also, you know, that's pretty good. The one piece of the pie that's still pretty small, but we think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be growing over the next few years is food waste. And that also gets composted at the, at the waste management district. And really, if we want to reach the 75%, the food waste is really where it's going to be at. So some waste reduction practices so that we can make that gray piece of the pie smaller. One of the big ones is to avoid single use of single use disposable plastics. So no single use plastic bags, that's not allowed uh, in the city. No single-use plastic utensils or straws. We passed an ordinance a few years ago on, on that uh, topic. No polystyrene, number six containers. So I will point out that the plastics industry has now, you know, we don't see styrofoam ne nearly as much, but number six plastic, you do see it. And sometimes it doesn't look like styrofoam, but it's still polystyrene and it's still not recyclable. We also want to use, want to minimize the, our use of single 
single-use plastic bottles as much as possible and use larger dispensers instead. And then move away from plastic giveaways. Uh, we love compostable giveaways. So yes, flower giveaways are great. <laughs> Uh, we also, you know, whenever possible, we're using materials and then using materials that have a high recycle content. So, you know, recycled paper, but then also recycled, if, if using any kind of plastic, recycled plastic is better, uh, et cetera. Uh, limiting the use of flyers because that's, you know, that's another source of litter. They're, they're a source of litter and they're, you know, more waste. And um, the last one is also an important uh, element is having, you know, well-marked recycling and compost containers at every trash bin. And I think we, are, we already do that at public events. One thing that is good to add is monitors also, because it really, oftentimes, you know, we do get contamination even with the prop proper labeling. We saw that at our, at our city event, actually the other, week. I was like, ah, oh, they're all labeled and yet they're still contaminated. <laughs> so contamination, um, that's, that's another, that's a really big issue for us. Um, cur currently, uh, this pie represents the contamination uh, on the aggregate uh, for the cities, um, the, all the cities waste streams the waste management district every summer does a, a survey of hold on, does a survey of our uh, of our waste streams in the city and tells us how much contamination there is uh, in all of our waste streams, and our average contamination is about twenty three percent, which is pretty high. I mean that's almost a quarter of everything that goes into the blue bin is is not supposed to be in there, and as you can see, there's a decent amount of food waste that goes in there. And so we really need to get that out of, out of the blue bins. And then other sort of general ref refuse, including film plastic is another one that's always uh, consistently an issue. So I have a little game for you guys. Can you, can you tell me what doesn't belong in that blue bin right now? And I'll, I'll just, yes, go ahead. I'll just say this. this. These are pictures I took at the public works in the public works of Blue Bin, and I use it in a training for public works stuff. Well, so. there's a lot of plastic, plastic gloves, but it looks like plastic packaging. Yeah, so these plastic film is not recyclable. So the plastic bottle is, but the plastic film is not. So the plastic film really should not be in there, and plastic gloves should not be in there either. That's about great. the gasoline can. The gasoline can is, I would put that in the garbage too, just because of the kind of residues that are in there. Um, I would I would not put that in the recyclables. Do we get ice yeah. creams or something? Huh? <laughs> no. What, what? Do we get ice cream? Do we get ice cream? Uh, do you get ice cream? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but it has to be edible ice cream cones. Is sure. there anything else in there that's not recyclable? Well, you mentioned metal and recyclable that doesn't belong. So are those cans okay? The cans are okay. Yeah. Well, what metal doesn't belong? Um, so aluminum is recyclable. So that, that goes, uh, that goes no problem. I think I actually, wait, let me go back up, but I'm pretty sure the metals here, that is not part of contamination. Refuse and food waste and film plastic are contamination, but metal is not. Metal is actually very recyclable. So aluminum cans are great. They're one of the most recyclable and one of the most valuable recyclable material that, that we have. Thank you. So yes, metal can is good. The other thing that's not recyclable is this like uh, sort of paper towel type material. Paper towels are not recyclable. But regular paper. Because, wait, paper towels because they have some kind of foreign object on them? Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because typically they are contaminated with foreign stuff on them, right? And usually when you throw them out, they have stuff on them. And then also it's a form of paper that is really low grade and does not recycle really well. Mm. So 
Uh, regular paper is fine. Paper towels, keep it out of the move-in. Okay, I've got another photo. Okay, about, what about this one? <laughs> Aside from the can being a little grimy. There's more paper towels. Yeah. In plastic. Yeah, that plastic bottle is fine, but again, that plastic, the plastic film stuff, no good. So and when you when you say plastic film, that one that's up there at the top left, that looks like a Ziploc bag. Yeah. Ziploc bags are included in the plastic film, yes? Correct. So Ziploc bags are not recyclable. Actually, I use those for my dog poop. Perfect. <laughs> for a second use, for a second use. I mean, not the first use. <laughs> Now, I have a friend who washes those Ziploc bags and reuses them because they're expensive and many times they, they're they hardly used, you know, just to one time to put something in the refrigerator and then eat it the next day. So the big ones are easier to wash. I have washed a few of the big ones. Yeah. yeah. Is that a food scrap? Is that a, is that a paper cup and is that a food scrap coming out of it? So or is that styrofoam? Yeah, that paper cup is actually, so that's that's one that always gets people. Paper cups are not recyclable because they do have, in order for them to be watertight or water resistant, they do have a thin layer of plastic film on the inside of them. And so they're not recyclable. So this one is also not recyclable. And yes, it does have something. I think it's just a little piece of paper underneath. But yeah, paper cups also not recyclable. But you know, I don't remember seeing signs that say, you know, no paper cups. I mean, it's very confusing if you have, you know, coffee cup, paper, then you go to the recycle thing and where do you put I, it? Yes, I agree. And the thing is, so what we've done is instead of saying, don't put stuff in there, we tend to just say, put just these things in there mm -hmm. because it's, it's a little, it's a lot easier if people were just to recycle just bottles and cans already, we would be in a better shape than if, than putting the wrong thing in the blue bin. It's better that we don't put, that we have, that we don't put some things that are actually recyclable in the garbage. Then we put a bunch of things that should be in the garbage in the recyclable. Uh, because the problem that we find is we end up with so much contamination, the whole thing ends up in the landfill. And so we've, we've lost that opportunity. And so last one, is there anything in there that is not recyclable? That's a bag. So yeah, this, this is interesting. This is an Arbor Day mm -hmm. uh, banner. And that's kind of a plastified fiber not recyclable everything else is good the cardboard great the this this can is also recyclable but yes that plastified material uh, textile material not recyclable Anya would you remind everybody of the good numbers for recycling because I think I now have it memorized but we had that conversation about what to look for on the bottom of things because I was throwing a couple things in the recycle at my house <clears throat> that I should not have done and now I am better. Right, so you wanna avoid, so you don't wanna put number six or number seven in the recyclables. So number six is polystyrene. So you wanna avoid that at all costs. Polystyrene is, is really bad plastic. Uh, number seven <clears throat> is a compostable plastic and that's also typically not recyclable. It's, it's just a different uh, material. So number six, number seven goes uh, in the garbage um, typically in your, the other materials you're going to find in your, um, in your, in your kitchen areas or in your, in your home are going to be number one, number three, and number five. And those are all recyclable. Anya, yes, okay. it's Leslie. I don't know if you're going to talk about this, but the compostable plates and stuff that we used at our event, do those go in the composting or do they go in the recycle? So there we go. And we're getting to it, Leslie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so 
here's sort of the short of it in terms of what's not accepted in the blue bin, what goes in the green bin, and what, where you put compostable products. So in the blue bin, you do not put coffee, cu coffee cups and coffee lids do not go in the blue bin. Plastic film and plastic bags do not go in the blue bin. Plastic utensils and straws also are not allowed. Food is a big no-no. Bottles with liquid still in them is also a big no-no. That's, that's one of our big sources of contamination also is, you know, if you're gonna put a bottle in the recyclable, it needs to be empty. And compostable products do not go in the blue bin. They are not recyclable. We kind of just, just to make it simple for people, compostable items at the moment should just go in the garbage. We're just gonna keep it simple for people at the moment and just say compostable should go in the garbage. Techni there are some technicalities. I think I shouldn't go into them because I will confuse people. Uh, but in the green bin, really you can put, you can put all your landscape waste and now you can also put food scraps and flowers. That means in a green bin at home, as well as in the green bin at work and in the yellow bin, um, you can, food scraps and flowers are welcome. The compostable items at the moment, we're still trying to um, iron things out with the waste management district. And so for now, they're not considered compostable. They, they make the compostable composting process a little more complex and they haven't yet had figured out a way to uh, really digest them properly. So for now, compostable items go in the garbage. Yes. And by that, I mean any foodware that says compostable on it. And as, as we noticed, so we had our city, um, our employee, uh, what, is, what was it called? The employee event that we had maybe a couple of weeks back. You know, we did realize with Ashley and Leslie, we looked at the, the, the utensils that we had they looked just like a compostable utensil. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at the detail of it, it says non-compostable, but it, it has been designed to look like a compostable utensil. And that's the other reason why right now they're just saying blanket, put all compostables in the garbage is because the industry is sort of hiding non-compostable utensils as compostable so that they can sell it as green mm -hmm. and it's causing all kinds of issues at, at the landfill at the recycling facility so if for us at this point until this has been really figured out we prefer to say just put it in the garbage and and the, the one good thing about that is it's still going to compost faster than if you had a plastic utensil so it is still greener to use a compostable even if it ends up in the landfill it will decompose faster even in the landfill than it would if it was plastic. So, so that's a long answer to that short question. Um, and then if there are any questions, there are there is a really good tool out there uh, for everybody. It's called What Goes Where. It's an app you can put on your phone or it can't, or you can look at it on the web, uh, whatgoeswhere.info. It is, it was developed for our region specifically, so you can figure out if you have a question about anything, where you should put it, uh, whether it should go in the green bin, blue bin, garbage, or if there's another way to uh, dispose of it, uh, then it, that app will help you find that out. Okay, and then last but not least, just a quick word on climate action. We uh, just released our draft climate action plan. Um, it's posted on our climate committee webpage on the city's website. Uh, and it does have some items that do uh, relate to community activities. Uh, the primary goals of the climate action plan are to move us towards electrification. So moving away from natural gas and towards more use of more electricity, encouraging alternative transportation. So uh, moving away from gas vehicles basically, and either, you know, walking, biking, or electric uh, vehicles. 
and then reducing our solid waste uh, going to the landfill. So in that sense, that, that connects really well with uh, the waste reduction we just talked about. Uh, one of the items in the climate action plan is uh, what I call an Earth Day Fair, which would be a fair that would um, you know, advertise a lot of the resources available to the public that most people don't know about, but that are there to help people move towards you know, changing things to electric or um, reducing their energy use or buying an um, electric bike or buying an electric vehicle. There's all kinds of rebates and resources out there to help people. And so it would, you know, that would be a place where people could actually learn more about that. Uh, some other programs that are in the plan that will be developed over time is a green business certification program and a green visitor certification program. And those would be to help uh, reward those businesses and visitors that really um, adopt our values and, and go the extra mile to uh, minimize their impact. <clears throat> and here is just a quick uh, look at why we're pushing electrification and then alternative transportation and waste reduction. If you look on the right side of this table, um, these are the greenhouse gas emissions throughout the, our, our community. And you can see that transportation accounts for about 46% of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the city. And then the burning of natural gas amount accounts for about 43% of the uh, emissions in the city. And then solid waste is another 10%. So that's why we're pushing, you were, we're really focusing on these three topics uh, as far as climate action. And I think, and that's it, any questions? Wow, Agnes, that was absolutely awesome. I learned so much. That was great. And Leslie, I think, uh, Leslie, Ashley, I think that what goes where, I hope that's posted somewhere for people to find it. Uh, I mean, I learned a lot. So go ahead, you guys, questions. Yeah, it's all over the, well, the interwebs anyway. And then we do have it, I know Agnes has it multiple places on the website. We've got posters up here in both of our library buildings. So it is very helpful. Yeah, yeah. My friend had her get an event, and she had bamboo silverware and bamboo uh, plates because they were, you know, supposedly, you know, you can recycle those, or they would, you know. So that's why, and she researched to do that because she wanted to make her her little event, uh, you know, green as possible. Um, I guess you have to research to make sure that they're compostable. Yes, so bam bamboo is actually an interesting question that I would probably pose to the Waste Management District before specifically answering it because it is a, it is a plant fiber. So, you know, my first thought would be, oh, well, that might actually be, you might be able to put that in a green waste bin. I would want to triple check with them uh, that they're good with that before I advertise it, but I could I could check on that and give you guys that answer. The bamboo is actually one of the those few that actually would be would be compostable in the green bin. I have another question. Um, the food waste. I am now I have a container and I'm shocked how much food waste I have for one person. I had no idea banana peels and everything. And I'm putting those in my uh, the green with the uh, landscape uh, trash. How do you measure how much food is actually in, uh, you know, because it said on the chart food waste. How are you able to measure if we're here, how, we're, how more food is being put in with landscape trash? So the way that we have been, so it's, it's going to obviously change and be a little bit different. Uh, now that that new law has passed where you can put your your food waste with your with your green bin up until you know January of this year really the only uh, place where well the only the only re composting that was happening was a uh, food waste was from the restaurants so we were able to really quantify that because the food waste composting was coming in was coming into the landfill 
via the yellow bins. And the yellow bins really are just for food waste. And the yellow bins are actually getting, you know, will be phased out over time because we don't need a different bin now because whether it's food waste or landscape waste, it's all going to the same place now. Uh, so we were able to quantify that because the yellow bins were, um, were obviously their own container. The other thing we're able to identify is how much more material the, uh, the composter is receiving and therefore how much, because there's no reason why the green waste would be more now than it was last year or the year before, right? So if he's getting 10% more material, that 10% that Delta is from the food waste. And so he's looking right now, he's estimating about a 10, 15% additional waste coming through, which is probably, which is food waste. Do you uh, recommend that people uh, go out to Last Chance Mercantile and see how they're repurposing things? Because I was out there uh, about two months ago. I was so impressed at that place. I I send people there and they're taking, they're repurposing things that would go in the dump and it's heartening. Absolutely. Yes, they do. They do a really great job of re repurposing and reusing a lot of materials. Anything that still has some life in it, I would strongly recommend um, going to Last Chance. The other really good resource that is right next to Last Chance is our Household Hazardous Waste Facility. So if you have any cleaning chemicals you're no longer using or nail polish, nail polish remover, anything like that, uh, that really should not go in the garbage, those chemicals, they will take them for free. And that's a, that's a really good resource for a community. And it's really, um, you know, between Last Chance and the Household Hazardous Waste Facility, it's, it's a really great resource. And there's always really good stuff to find at Last Chance. I have found some really good things there. <laughs> Ms. Linda? Yeah, I, um, Donna, thank you. Because I was going to say, you know, living alone, I was surprised how my garbage has been reduced. My regular garbage has been re reduced because I'm putting more into the bin. And I was just wondering if people, what people's feedback uh, are about putting food waste in the, in the bin. Um, and then how do you clean that bin? Because at some point, um, I mean, I personally just have a hard time putting any meat or seafood in there. I, I don't know that I'll ever get to that point. Um, but you know, you, you, to clean it, you've got to put some soap and then where do you dump, where do you dump the bin? I mean, it's going to go into the storm drain. Right. So, so it sort of depends on whether you have a garden in your home or not. If you do have a garden that generates some, uh, landscape clippings, the really good thing to do is put some clippings, whether it's dead leaves or grass clippings or that, that kind of that sort of thing at the bottom before you start putting food waste in there. It'll absorb the liquids from the food waste and you won't even have to really clean your bin. Uh, that's that's you know recommendation number one. The other thing that I do uh, at home personally is I keep my um, my kitchen pail in the freezer all week and I don't put my food waste into my green bin until the end of the week the day before it has to before it gets picked up so then the food waste doesn't have time to sort of decompose in the green bin so if you don't have a lot of stuff in the freezer it's a really good use of the freezer I do the same as well with the freezer I, I started off with it on the counter and then I remembered what Anya said about the freezer and so I don't eat a lot of ice cream and I have the room. So I, the, the freezer works flawlessly because there's no smell building up over time. And I do have, you know, some clippings and things from feeding the rabbit and stuff like that. And the freezer has, has been a godsend. Yes, yeah, so between those two, that really helps not having to wash the bin. If you have to wash the bin, obviously do it into like a planter or something. Um, you know, just, just dump it into a planter. I mean, you can always use some some kind of a, a biodegradable soap in it that doesn't that doesn't that's going to degrade over time. But um, if you're going to do that, you definitely need to put it in a planter. Um, yeah, I just had a, a few more comments. Um, well, I learned that if food waste is on 
um, it, it, the diff difference between compostable and contamination. So basically, if we're eating at an outdoor venue that has has bins, if you have food residue, it does not go into recyclables, regardless of what the utensil or the plate is. Is that correct? Because Many times when you're at those picnics and everyone's got recyclable plates, and then I see people go to the bins and then stand there. Like, where does this go? Right. So utensils go in the garbage. They're not going to get recycled. So okay. utensils uh, just go in the garbage. As far as recyclable, so some clamshells will be recyclable potentially. Some clamshells are like number one plastic. Those ones, if the food has been scraped out of them and there's just a very minimal amount of residue, they can go in the recyclable. Well, define minimal. I mean, if someone has, you know, three like French fries. If, if, someone... if there's like, like, you know, a quarter of a burger, three French fries in there, I would say that's no longer a residue. That's, yeah. that's you know, okay. that's a solid amount of food. But that's the kind of food that can, you know, you dump that in the garbage and then you stick your... Mm -hmm. um, it, it's you know if you have if it's been scraped out decently well I would say it can go into the recyclable the main thing the main idea to remember with that is food residue the reason why food residue on on um, on your on your foodware is a problem in the recyclables is because it contaminates other, it contaminates right. the paper especially. So if you have a bunch of like mayonnaise, you know, ketchup, those kinds of liquidy stuff, that's yeah. going to contaminate paper and then it'll it'll mess up your entire recyclable thing. So you just kind of keep in mind, you know, if it's mostly kind of dry, it, it, it's fine in the recyclable. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry to take up so much time, but just some observations. I mean, I recently got uh, a new gas range um, that I ordered in January and it was kind of fun to pick out. And afterwards, after I ordered it, I realized I buyer's remorse that I should have really looked into induction, uh, an induction range. And if I had been more educated, even though I was in, uh, you know, in the professional cooking business for a long time and we looked at it professionally, I really regret not getting an induction range, and that just was is not on, you know, our radar anymore. So, what what's is anyone encouraging that? I mean, I ordered this from Ferguson; they did not mention that as an option or that that I should even consider it. Yeah, that's that's why we were that's why we did the we put this Earth Day Fair idea in the Climate Action Plan. It's because we need to put these ideas more top of mind for people. Um, if, I think if people know a little bit more, they will be more likely to go there. And there are some resources and some incentives out there to switch um, to switch your your. And I don't know if the ranges are one of them, but there might be actually some rebates for for um, electric ranges, and then there are rebates for electric water heaters. Uh, so there are some resources out there and some rebates out there for uh, going electric. Um, and then, then just my last comment on this. All right, so I got this range and it was just covered with styrofoam plastic, tape, plastic. I, you know, I spent a few hours just getting all of that stuff off. There was some creative use of cardboard that almost looked like two by fours, which I thought, well, this is an interesting invention. But I just had a heap of bad stuff. Um, and so it, who, who's going to be regulating that down the road? Uh, hopefully the state. <laughs> so the state has some very, uh, they have some very lofty goals. They're really going after the stuff. So they, they are trying, uh, but you know, we are, our entire industry our entire system of, you know, I mean, the whole economy sort of is sitting on this, on, on these issues that, you know, we just haven't really wanted to think about them. And so slowly we're starting to bring that back into the conversation. And by the way, all these plastics that we're generating for, for packaging, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an insane amount of plastics that are used in packaging. 
you know, how do we incorporate back that back into the cost of those uh, of those products? Because disposing of them and you know, landfilling them is a really costly. It's costly for you know a, the ent entire communities. I mean, it's mountains of plastics that are you mm -hmm. know, going into landfills and or ending up in the ocean and all, all the environmental impacts of all this plastic use. Is you know. Well, thank you. I I won't. I'll stop talking. Yeah, well, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, like Linda, I just recently purchased a dishwasher, and I found out if you have an aluminum, not aluminum, but a stainless steel interior, it dries quicker, uses elec less electricity. And I got an energy efficient one that I'll, I send the rebate in uh, to do that. But Best Buy did that mine, and they took all of the packaging with them. So I was real thrilled that it wouldn't go in, in the Carmel, and I didn't have to dispose of it. But PG gives these out, which I was lucky enough to get one, and my first uh, food waste container. And I don't put it in the freezer, but it doesn't smell. It has something on the top and it's easy to wash out. Uh, you can put a plastic bag in there that I got with maybe with potatoes in, and then I throw the bag in the trash. But um, I know the city gave out containers, they said, and I was wondering if we were going to give out more because this was my incentive, and that's when I've been doing that. But it doesn't smell. It's small. It's not too ugly, and I have it sitting in my kitchen. I emptied it today, actually, and I just kind of rinsed that out, and it's great. So I'm just curious if the city's going to have more of these to encourage, because people are buying them, I know. Yeah, just, that's, I'm really happy to see you're making good use of our yeah. uh, <laughs> I am. I am. Um, and so so we did we did have quite a few out that, and we ran out like in a week and a half. And so then we purchased some more and then we ran out of those. We don't have any plans at the moment to buy more. Um, I do know that the other peninsula cities uh, do still have inventory. So if people want to go pick them up, um, you didn't hear it from me, but uh, if people want to go pick them up, either in PG or Monterey, I know they still have inventory over there. Um, so I would, I would recommend doing that. We, we may do another round uh, this next fiscal year of purchases of, of those uh, to, to help still, because I, I know they're incredibly popular in Carmel. So uh, we, we're not purchasing them right away, but we might do one more, one more round of purchasing. The other thing too, is they've been so popular. The supplier is now out till, I wanna say October. So it, it's, yeah. They're, they're going out like hotcakes all over the state, apparently. Another question, there's a city in Southern California that at their farmer's market, they give out compost material for people to take home and put on their lawns. And that's extreme. My friend gets it, uh, you know, not every week, but she doesn't have to buy fertilizer and a lot of other things because she can get free compost material for her yard. And I don't know if that's something down the road the peninsula is thinking, if that's in the climate ideas or not. Yeah, we're working on this uh, at the moment, actually, because as part of this uh, SB 1383 law that the state passed uh, and that we have to um, implement, there is a requirement for municipalities to purchase a certain amount of compost each year as a way to use up the compost that is generated from the food waste that is generated, right? Well, there's way more compost than the city can use. So we are looking at uh, giving away compost. We're trying to figure out how to uh, how to work the program so that it's, it can be doable, but I'm, I'm uh, anticipating there will be a monthly um, pile of compost somewhere. It may be at Real Park, it may be somewhere. Uh, for people to be able to pick up compost, actually. I just had a question. First of all, thanks for that great presentation, and I'm glad we have you on board. Uh, and, and I know I'm going to go to Linda's for dinner, and we're going to go wash dishes at Donna's. Um, so I think we're good there. Um, 
I, I, you know, as I think about this, uh, the cynic in me asks, how are we monitoring the facilities? Because, you know, calling something tainted is a pretty easy thing to do. And it seems like it'd be quite cheap to consider a recycling load tainted and dump it in landfill versus having to actually process uh, the recycling. How, who, who's the watchdog on this? Uh, I'm guessing it's not us as the city. Um, is it the state or, you know, who's making sure that recycling facilities are actually recycling what we think should be recycled? Right. Um, actually, you know, our waste management district, I would, I would recommend actually taking a field trip to the waste management district and, and I've, I've been out there. Yeah. I've yeah. At their recycling there. facility. It's, it's actually a really interesting field trip. It's and they're they're always happy to, uh, to do field trips with uh, elected officials or with anybody who's, who's interested in, in looking at their facilities. They really try. I think they really, their heart is in the right place. They really want to do the right thing. The recycling facility is, is really quite uh, impressive. Uh, so, you know, aside from knowing that the waste management district is a great partner in this effort, they are regulated by CalRecycle and they do have to keep track of everything and gotcha. record everything and do reporting on everything. So, so they are quite regulated as well. Kind of state level, top down. Obviously, yeah. this, we're not trying to regulate it as a city. Uh, we are not trying to regulate them as a as a yeah. state. We we do work with them pretty closely. So they have a board of directors because they're a they're um, a special district. And uh, one of our council members, Carrie Tice, is, uh, is on that board. I believe she's still the chair, actually, of, of the board. So they are regulated in that, by the cities in that way that we have, um, we have elected officials on their board. The other thing is they do have a technical advisory committee uh, that's made up of staff from the district as well as staff from the cities. And um, I sit on that, on that committee as well. So we don't go look in detail at their books or anything, but uh, we do work yeah. very closely with them and they are regulated by the state. That's great. I mean, it's awesome that we have this, you know, available to us and that we're pushing for more and it, it's great that they're a great partner for us. That's fantastic. I have another question regarding coffee cups. Um, has all the businesses been advised, and I don't say mandated, advised of the products that are available because I know Starbucks and a lot of those are trying to go to single use that you get to keep the cup and reuse it. So, you know, they coffee cups are their, their livelihood. So are they going to ones that are more green? Are there more green coffee cups? Yeah, so there are compostable coffee cups out there where the lining, the, the lining on the inside of the cup is compostable. So those are definitely greener than the, the standard coffee cups. I believe most of our coffee shops in town use those, um, and they're supposed to by, by our own requirements. Uh, going to reusable cups is always a better option, though, because reusable obviously does not generate any waste. Um, it just gets washed and gets used again. So it's great that Starbucks is pushing that way. And some of our local coffee shops do at least have that option that you can do reusable as opposed to take away coffee cup. Um, if we have, we did quite a bit of outreach with them a couple of years ago, I wanna say, or yeah, a couple of years ago uh, when we put out our, our requirements uh, to move away from, from disposable, from plastic disposable foodware. I haven't done a lot of outreach lately, uh, but I'm looking uh, into doing a little bit more of that again. Just to remind people, every, you know, every few years it's good to remind people of what's out there and what is greener and how they can, because most, most of our businesses are very conscious. It's just, you know, they have a business to run, they have other things to worry about. So it's not at the top of their mind all the time, so. And I see that Joe Todd uh, has raised her hand. Yes, um, thank you very much. A few years ago, I, I think before you were here, there was somebody from the Monterey uh, area that had a citywide, you know, here at our city, uh, city uh, hall, where we, uh, it was supposed to be a community um, meeting, and it was very informative, and I wish we could have another one of those, because I'm 
like what you're giving here is great, but you know, there are not that many people are getting this information. <coughs> Excuse me. I have used what goes where and uh, for things like I, and it says, if it's not listed, please, shall we look this up? And I put the item in, but I never get the answer. So, and there's also something that they're advertising on the radio about uh, um, I recycle and uh, to get information that way too. So that's very good. And I also uh, know someone who is using the uh, bamboo uh, towels for, and they researched it and supposedly um, they're able to recycle that, but who knows? And the, uh, I was wondering if they could, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if they, if uh, it could be re, uh, like, you know, the bins that they're put out at the farmer's market and they have the pictures of what can go into each one, if they would uh, put that up to date, because I think it's a little different than uh, what we're used to putting into the bins, because the bins are different there. And if they would, it, I think they have changed it once, but I just wondered if, if that is something that's kept up to date. And um, are you talking see. about the bins at the farmer's market? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we updated the, the food bin uh, the little, the little, um, I'll take a look at it. For the yeah, no, I yeah. did look and see that that said that because I, we had, uh, all the things that were, uh, the items that were in, could be compost and it's, it would say it's compostable, but then, uh, on the little picture that is on the, uh, at the farmer's market, it says no. So I think that that's, they're keeping that up to date. So I just wanted to make sure that that is up to date. Yes. at the moment and you're saying now just to put a lot of this stuff in the garbage and not uh yeah it's it's just for the sake because we've seen so many issues with you know people not being able to tell the difference between you know what's compostable and not compostable and the labeling being misleading and the it's at, at the moment until the industry fixes itself a little bit and until we have a better system, maybe at the waste management district, we, we'd rather just keep it simple for everyone. Yeah, well, that was very, that's very helpful. And I, I just hope that we can have a, a city meeting too, to, because nobody, like the people in my building, they don't know what's going on. I put, try to put information uh, out, but uh, it's, you know, or is something in the pine cone at least. But okay, I just have one other thing. I have to leave and I'm sorry, I'm gonna say this now, but I just wanted to compliment the uh, staff on the wonderful flower uh, arrangements and the flower, they were giving out flowers at the farmer's market uh, last from other state. It was just really wonderful. And that touch of going out and giving little bouquets to people walking through. So thank you very much. And I have to sign out now, but thank you very much for your report. It was great. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I have, I have a couple of comments. So one is, you know, I always think, and this this is my my bad, that oh, it's better to recycle than to throw it in the trash. You know, it's like you stand there and go, well, I got to save this. I I'm trying to save the planet, and we should just be putting it in the trash. So that was a big eye opener for me. And the other thing is, Ashley, when since this was about special events, and so when somebody takes out a permit. Is there anything on the permit that covers that they need to be sustainable or these are what we'd like this, you know, to do? Um, Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah. So that they're, they're aware of our local laws that we have in place and we ask them specifically for the larger scale events, what their um, waste management plan is. So do they need extra bins? I mean, the event might be small enough that that's not um, a requirement the other thing we ask in particular beach weddings is um, everybody is required to pack in, pack out. Not always perfect, but everything they bring down to the beach, as we saw from the first slide of Agnes's presentation, I recognized a trash bin overflowing in one of the enclaves at the beach. So um, not always perfect, but we do remind them multiple times during the permit process, it is pack in, pack out. You take everything with you when you go, so. I have a question. Uh, I made a note about the storm drains. Do all of them have screens to catch uh, things? And when you talked about sanitary sewers, 
I, I'm not sure where they are or what that means. And my house is on a hill and there's a, a, a the water waste comes down the hill next to my house and it opens on a, onto the street. And it's just a large pipe, I guess you would call it. And it washes down the street and still goes downhill. And that's just, that's not a sewer. It's just bringing that water waste down to the ocean. But the, I've never heard of a sanitary sewer. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I should have. I, I actually had it in the back of my mind when I was talking and I should have explained. So what you see in your street with that, that sort of uh, swale and the big pipe, this is so, st part of the storm drain system. This is definitely part of our drainage system. This just transfers rainwater down the hill uh, out to the beach. And there are no screens on, there are no screens on our storm, uh, on our storm drains. The, we have, like I said, we have those vaults that collect some of the, the biggest uh, material out of our biggest drains, but it's really sort of a, a small piece of the pie. A lot of material still makes it all the way out to the ocean. So that's our storm drains. So storm drains are there to collect rainwater and transfer it. It's, they're really there to avoid flooding. Right. The purpose of storm drains is to avoid flooding. They take the water from the top of the hill and bring it down the hill. Now the sanitary sewer is the, the drains that are connected to all your indoor, um, your indoor systems. So your shower, your sinks, your kitchen sink, all of these, all the water that goes down the drain uh, from those, um, from inside your home, goes and your toilet um, goes down to the sanitary sewer. The sanitary sewer goes to the wastewater treatment facility that is uh, managed by the Carmel Area Wastewater District. And that's located in the, it's kind of located at the mouth of the Carmel River, um, uh, just to, to the south of town. So the sewer is completely separate from the st storm drain. They don't connect. And the sewer, there are sewer lines all through most of our streets uh, because it collects uh, water from each of your houses, right? Everybody's houses, all the, the commercial buildings, all those buildings are connected to the sewer. So when you pour water into an indoor drain, then it actually gets treated at the wastewater treatment facility. If you pour something in the storm drain, which is the outdoor uh, areas, that doesn't go through any treatment that just flows direct out to the beach so that's sort of the difference between the two systems uh we still shouldn't put you know chemical you know really harsh chemicals etc gasoline all that down the on the sewer because that's potential for real issues but the sewer can manage you know can manage more contaminated water than the storm drain can does that make sense no i just want to no i already knew but I did some research and there are two sewer systems in Carmel and uh, a neighbor had a sewer problem and wanted me to help pay to fix it and uh, found out that they're on a different sewer system. I get a sewer bill, their sewer is on their property tax bill. And so I was researching and I'm not even on the same system. There was one system and they put in a second system and they, they all go, I believe, to the mouth of the river into the same thing. But there are supposedly two systems depending on when you built your house, which one they tied into. So that's I'm not aware of that. Yeah, check into that one because uh, there are, you know, so. Right. And so, yeah, the other thing to know is because it is managed, this, the sanitary sewer, oh, and that's, that's, a, that's a fun little tidbit. So the sanitary sewer is managed by, the entire system is managed by the wastewater, uh, by the Kermit Area Wastewater District, which is a special district, which is separate from the city. The city really does not manage anything related to the sanitary sewer. If you call us about the sanitary sewer, we will direct you to the Kermit Area Wastewater District. One thing that most people don't know, uh, which tends to upset them very much when I tell them, 
is that they are responsible for their sewer, the entire sewer lateral that connects their house all the way to the sewer main that's in the middle of the street. So if there is a portion of the sewer lateral, which is in the public right of way, but that is broken in the public right of way, the homeowner is responsible for replacement of that sewer lateral from their house all the way to the sewer main in the middle of the street. It's something that upsets a lot of people because oftentimes the issues that we end up running into in the city of Carmel is tree root intrusion into sewer laterals, which then co causes overflows. Um, and when that happens, they typically have to replace the whole sewer lateral. And that can be a little bit costly. And that's when people realize that they are in fact responsible for the entire length of that sewer lateral. So it's, it's good to keep that whole thing, uh, you know, checked, checked on a regular basis and keep it clear because having to replace it is not fun. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Anya. That was a beautiful, beautiful presentation. And I think we all learned a lot. Thank you for having me. Anyone else out there? Any any other public comments? I can call you anytime uh, regarding uh, uh, we have a building in Carmel and I want to work toward making it more sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Wine no cups, wine plastic cups what I need to buy instead of plastic. There's, there's a lot of good questions to and to find out. Yeah, you'll get the Women's Club whipped into shape. And we'll keep working on our events and um, community activities. would love to coordinate with you on Earth Day Fair when you start moving towards that. And oh, I know I'd love to coordinate yes. with you guys, yes. We, we've got a good crew here. We know our stuff with events, so we'd love to support that. So just let us know and we'll get it added to the calendar and maybe even form another ad hoc committee. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move on to item number three, receive an update on the farmer's market. So um, farmer's market is going really well. Um, we have new vendors swapping in and out. You should all be seeing more produce. It's berry time, which is wonderful. Um, thank you to John and Ellen and Donna for being at the farmer's market as we've heard so far. The flowers were very well received. It's just, it's nice to do a nice thing for people with no strings attached. We don't want an email. We don't need to know your name. Just here's a nice thing to, to bring you cheer. So I, I'm glad you guys enjoyed doing that. We'll, we'll keep on with that. Um, We'll have an update likely at the June meeting, if not the July meeting on our first third Thursday. Um, planning is getting started for that. So we're working towards that for what that will look like for July. And the plan currently is to have um, one a month, July, August, September, and October. Those are our, especially September, October, our best weather months. So we'll test it out, see how it goes, and then recalibrate for each event after that. And um, I think it should be pretty fun to get that that launched. So are there any questions about where we are with the, the market at this point? Oh, thank you. Only I wanted to thank you for the Friday letter. I didn't realize that our photo was in there. And, and, and uh, I mean, John and... Mm -hmm. And we were in we were in an Ellen, so I wanted to thank you. And also, uh, the women's club provided the tablecloth, so we're we're Which happy. I have, and I will make sure to get thank you to the women's club. I'll, well, I'll pick them up. You yeah. don't have to, you don't have to send a thank you. Don't waste a stamp. But uh, anytime we need anything, if we have it, that way you don't have to rent it, and we're happy to help provide it. So, thank you uh, for and Leslie was amazing. Thank her. She always is. She's yeah. Here. Thank you, Leslie. Could you refresh us on what's going to happen on the third Thursday? Uh, yes. So that is a conversation that's still ongoing about what we're looking at. But um, we're talking about when the market ends, shifting into Devendorf Park and doing some pop-up tastings. Um, one of the things we're still figuring out with our market manager is um, if we do any kind of tastings with alcohol or any of our local breweries 
what that would entail and what that would look like. So we'll probably just start off with food and art and music. So just an event and festivity in the park. And we'll, it'll probably be smaller to start off with. And then like we do with everything we evaluate, oh, what can we add in? Do we need some additional lights, you know, dependent on time of year and things like that. So that's what we're looking at at the moment, kind of a condensed down farmer's market, but more of a evening atmosphere and um, working with local restaurants, doing uh, prepared foods and tastings. Yeah, actually, uh, I saw a food truck at Sunset last week. I was both so very surprised that's the first time I've ever seen a food truck in, in town. And I was happy that they had a food truck. And, and it made me think about Third Thursdays is an ice cream truck or, you know, or something that wouldn't take away from the city, but that might be a fun thing to do. And I didn't know we could have a food truck. Is that a special permit? It's not, but I think that um, at this point with the number of requests we've gotten for one time, one offs, and they're around special event types of things for food trucks. Um, I would like to have a discussion with our planning and building director about potential since they're doing the design traditions update and then general plan and uh, probably a whole slew of updates to the municipal code if that's something that we can look at on a case-by-case -case basis or there's some sort of temporary permitting for a one-day type of event or you're serving a luncheon or things like that so I don't know what the one was at Sunset Center but I think that um, for special event types of things it would be uh, very nice to um, have as part of events. Thank you. All right, so we open it up to the public. Any public comments? All right, any any other commissioner comments? No, right. and actually I'm sad that I'm sad that Joe's gone. We have a new, uh, I should have brought a photo of it, a new sign down for the foot of ocean in Monte Verde. Um, our market manager has really been working on additional signage that I think is very fitting with Carmel. So if you're heading up from the beach on farmer's market day, you should see it there. I do think the dog situation is getting a little better. No. I saw it. we were, I mean, it's a little bit, we were there the other day though. And, and a, a, a couple brought a dog out that looked more like a horse. I swear they could have ridden a thing into the farmer's market, but uh, they did walk around uh, on it instead of going through, which I thought was a nice. I saw at least five to eight dogs carrying, walking, I, you know, and the big, the big dog that he saw. And uh, they don't bother me being there, but I know nobody complained to them that I saw. But uh, no, there were several dogs, Ellen and I saw them walking by too, John, before you even got there. Mm. So. Yeah, it goes up and down with better and worse and people actually stopping to read signs and doggy hitching posts. So we'll keep monitoring it. Yeah. All right, let's move on to item number four, receive updates and discuss the 2022 special events calendar. All right, so <clears throat> um, this last weekend, we just had the uh, Monterey County Vintners. So um, I will be presenting you all with an after action of that event at the June meeting. Um, next weekend, as uh, Linda mentioned at the start of this meeting, we have the Carmel Art Festival coming up. Um, and then our next city um, organized event uh, alongside the uh, post 512 um, veterans will be the Memorial Day ceremony Monday, May 30th. And Mayor Potter has volunteered to speak at that event. And this will be the first time um, too, if you have time, I encourage you, of course, since your Community Activities Commission to come to our events, but um, this one we will be testing out um, Glastonbury. Um, this will be our first Memorial Day or Veterans Day with uh, somebody outside doing the sound system, and I'm hoping that it will improve um, the sound quality for everybody in attendance, because the park can be noisy, especially when you're having a moment of silence or just one speaker and it's windy, so I think that Glastonbury will help. Um, and then for the rest of the year, we're just working on, um, you know, the POPs is coming up on July 4th. We're excited to work with them. Um, 
Home Crafters selection will be in July. Um, Car Week is still um, a little up in the air. I did provide a update to the city council about that. Um, we do, we will definitely have the Prancing Ponies car show on Thursday, August the 18th. And I've talked to the Pebble Beach Company. They're interested in returning next year, probably in some sort of different iteration. And then Concord on the Avenue um, is still, um, we still have that permit. It's still holding that Tuesday date and it's tentative um, and we'll see what happens. I should have more information mid month. So we'll see about, but we should have a, a good car week overall, I would think. Um, and then into September, we've got Sandcastle Contest. Um, we're also looking at September for the first uh, community group fair. Margie is working on that with Donna and Ellen. Um, and so stay tuned um, for a firm date on that. Um, and then we're already working on the um, homecoming parade and Margie's had some great ideas about um, that parade in particular and the um, Halloween parade um, looking at a slightly different abbreviated route from what we did last year. So it flows more smoothly. So I'm excited about that. So we can keep ourselves away from that intersection at Mountain View, Ocean and Unipro. Cause it's- I don't see the pumpkin roll. It's not on here yet. We're working on um, some of the budget numbers still. And we're also looking at dates. October is tricky to balance out with um, the school break. We found that doing that event at the start of the school break is not effective. Same with the end of break because everybody's traveling. So that coupled with the high school, the homecoming parade and Halloween parade, we're find, trying to find a good balance of where that will land and make sure that we will have adequate staff to support that event. Do we ever do bring your own pumpkin and do it after Halloween? <laughs> We've talked about that. Um, your own pumpkin. Yeah, the one challenge with that would be that the pumpkins can't have any paint or anything like that on them because they're going to be composted. And that was another thing that we've been talking sure. about and thinking about as staff, and we can bring this back to you for further discussion. But as we've been going through and looking at the cost of um, pumpkins in particular, it, it has gone up significantly uh, compared to prior years. Um, and so we're just, we've been talking about what you, what you just mentioned, John, asking people to bring their own pumpkins because the pumpkins that we have end up uh, being composted, which is great. But at the same time, we're buying these pumpkins just to smash them for fun and then compost them. So it's, especially after hearing Anya's talk, it, yes, it, it is fun, but how, how do we reconcile the pumpkin roll? And that may be one way to do it. Um, so I'll, I'll be bringing that, that event in particular back to all of you for dates and information and more in-depth discussion. But thanks for asking about that because that was, should we do this the week after Halloween and the things that we've been kicking around for, for that event? Um, I, I had a question. Are we going to be giving away pumpkins again at the farmer's market? Um, I have that on the calendar, yes. Well, I, I, I would love to see us tied into the giveaway so that we're just not wasting a lot of pumpkins. Um, and I understand the decoration now in the paint issue. Um, if people if, just carve them, that that's perfectly yes, fine. Yeah. And if we could do a tie-in with the market where we give part of the pumpkins away there and bring your pumpkin to the pumpkin roll, um, we could look at attempting something like that. I'll factor that into the staff report that I write. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. I think it's a really good idea uh, to have that pumpkin roll after Halloween, um, like John mentioned, and um, have people bring their pumpkins. Everybody always wonders what to do with their pumpkins. And so that might be really fun and an alternative uh, to um, have. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. Any other thoughts or comments about that? And like I said, I'll bring back something more in depth for pumpkin roll and dates. Um, Cause that was one of the ones we've been discussing, John was after Halloween. Are we focused on all events or just the pumpkin roll right now? 
I was just running through and the question the was, calendar. where's the pumpkin roll date? And so that was one. So I'll, I'll come back with something else so we can really get into the nitty gritty on, on some of those things. And the only other thing I, I was, I was going to ask, have we ever done a, um, like a soapbox derby? <laughs> I can hear right now. I can hear Margie and Leslie laughing in the next office. You've just made Margie's dreams come true. She has wanted to either do a soapbox derby or put strap wheels to pumpkins and have them race. She wants a race. So well, the answer I mean, to that is. We? I mean, how are we? How are we? Soapbox Derby. Soapbox Derby for children. Uh, we have not done anything like that as of yet. No. <laughs> I mean, I was just thinking of obviously, like from a resource standpoint, it might be kind of neat to have, to get the community together and have different groups build soapbox derby cars or parents get together or whatever. And and from a resourcing standpoint, obviously, it's shutting down the streets and it's lining them probably with hay bales. But but there might be an easy way to do it with our grade at some point in the future I don't know. The okay i'm going to make a note of that my follow-up question was that since this is on the, the heels of our pumpkin roll discussion right before this would this be in place of the pumpkin roll or in addition to and, and we have talked about it before yeah but uh, I, I I'm, I'm open to all ideas all ideas okay excellent donna as a comment my son is his work is he times events and he times go-kart races uh, at the prep schools in the East Coast. And and then I was somewhere once on a committee where they had those and you have to purchase the kits so they're all the same and then it takes a couple of months or a month to build them. Teams, like John said, you know, be at a realty or a grocery store or a family. So it, it takes quite a while to do it kind of correctly to resource all that information and then to time it uh, and you think nobody cares who wins but they do care by seconds or you know whatever so it, like I said my son times foot races motorcycle races go-kart races so we could get from for free information on timing and the actual uh, length of a course so as a resource, if they decided to do this, but it will take a committee quite a while to sort of figure it out and a route that's sort of downhill, but they don't kill each other. So that's a lot of work. I think it's a, a good idea in the big scheme of things and so much fun. The Monte Carlo Carmel, you know, <laughs> the race through Monte Carlo. So, but it, it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of planning and work. Well, we'll put it with our, our list of new events to explore. I think it, it, it's, a, it's a fun one, and yes, yeah. we'll see where we land. Okay, any, any public comments on this, on our events? No? All right, last item. Consider if, when to return to in-person community activity meetings. So nothing has changed since the last meeting. There have been no restrictions that the state has changed or our city with regards to um, public meetings in the council chamber. Um, you still need to be masked. So as of our last meeting, we decided we didn't want to meet in person unless we were, we were able to be unmasked so we could see each other's faces. So no changes. All right. I'm happy with that. Everybody else? Yep. OK. And anybody, future agenda items? Anything I've got a more robust um, discussion about the uh, pumpkin roll. Um, and uh, after action for Monterey County Vintners. Mm -hmm. And we'll revisit the calendar. Uh, because if there's any other events around the holiday that we may plan on doing. So we'll always revisit the calendar and would be obviously starting in June on maybe even till February, since none of us are leaving, thank God. Yes, so we'll, yeah, we'll keep on with reviewing the calendar. And you'll update us on the third Thursday. I will keep you updated on third Thursday. I'll have a, a 
our market manager probably come back in June to talk about where we are in depth. They've got planned for July. And That's giveaways, do, do we, uh, I would like to see each of those events, if we plan to have a giveaway, the planned or something sustainable, uh, Valentine's Day and you know Mother's Day, we're obviously flowers. But if we plan to give away anything July 4th, that's sustainable if that's a plan out of our budget uh, that we're up to date on giveaways. Yeah, we'll bring a calendar. I think we had talked about doing this and I, I dropped the ball. We'll pick, we talked about doing quarterly giveaways. So four times a year um, in each of the quadrants. And we missed the beginning of this year. So this will be this one. And then we'll figure out what we're gonna do for the summertime and the fall and um, work with our farmer's market vendors on that and then figure out who's gonna be doing the actual giving away. So I'll include that in the packet for next month. Ice cream cones. That would be delicious. We met a snow cone lady, actually, Leslie and I, and yeah, that would be fun too. Thank you. All right. All right. Ice cream okay in the city? I remember the sidewalk, you know, can't get ice cream on our sidewalks. Well, we know that snow is allowed and we know that yeah. cones are compostable in our stomachs. So I think snow cones should be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Great. Anybody else? Anything? Nothing. Let's adjourn. See you guys later. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you, staff. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Yeah. Bye, Alan. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Alan.